Hello, everyone. Today I have with me Father Jonathan Ivanov, and uh, we will speak about some common objections or questions <laughs> Protestants, Western Christians have of the Orthodox Church. Um, but before we do that, I want Father Jonathan to give a brief introduction to himself and then give some thoughts uh, on apologetics that I think can help frame this discussion that we, or questions that we will have later. John, thank you very much. And, and thank you for this invitation to your podcast. Um, my name, is, as you've just uh, introduced me, is uh, Father Jonathan Ivanov. I've been a priest for over 28 years uh, here in uh, New York on Long Island at a church called St. John the Theologian. And I have um, gra been graduated from St. Vladimir's uh, Seminary back in 1986. <clears throat> I was ordained about six years later, uh, first as of course as a deacon, which I was for about a year and a half. And then I've been a priest for 28 years since April of uh, 1993. Um, the area of apologetics, which is why I'm so grateful, John, for your invitation, is, is an area that, um, at least here in America, has become much more popular and with, with much more interest and people in wanting to engage in it uh, than at any time in the past, I would say, 40 or 50 years that, that I've seen. And so I think the, the topic is very timely, especially since the Protestants are going through their own um, in some cases, self-destruction. And there are a lot of people, a lot of human beings, a lot of souls uh, really wondering what has happened to their church and wondering, is the church someplace else? Does it exist? Where is Christ? Where can I find him? Where can I find him in an unadulterated manner, in an unchanged manner, unlike my church, which is changing, you know, right from out from under my feet. So that's what's happening here in America. And that's what's bringing a lot of people into orthodoxy is this idea of trying to find the true church. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is a growing interest, not only among Protestants in general, but among um, Black Christians here in America to find what they call the early church or the ancient faith. And it's, it's bringing us Orthodox into contact with and dialogue with uh, many in that uh, particular church field. So the, 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 when Jesus said the fruits are white for arv harvest, that phrase never went out of style. And it's just as much relevant and applicable today as it has ever been. So thank you again for the invitation to the podcast. Yes. Thank you for accepting my invitation. And I'm really looking forward to uh, this discussion. So uh, you told me before the interview that you had some uh, thoughts uh, on the apologetics. Is it, uh, do you feel you have said it in this introduction or do you want to add something to that? Well, I, I, <coughs> I think it, it's, it would be good if we did add a little bit to the discussion because the, the topic that uh, we need to cover uh, when we speak about apologetics really needs to be understood very well. First of all, there, there's, there's fundamental differences between us and the Protestants and us and the Roman Catholics. Now, us and the Roman Catholics is pretty black and white, but when we talk about the Protestants, remember that we're talking about a huge um, uh, scale of difference between, let's say, the, the, the liturgical <coughs> Protestants like the, like the Anglicans and, and maybe to a lesser degree the Methodists and Lutherans um, versus the Calvinists versus the Evangelicals and the Pentecostals and so forth. So when, when we lump <coughs> all Protestants together, we, we probably complicate apologetics a little bit, but we can make a couple observations that are really, really important for uh, our own Orthodox faithful to understand, and even for Protestants to understand when they engage with us. And, and the first thing I would, I would observe is, is the difference between, <coughs> and the difference, uh, the importance we place on the difference between written and oral sources. So written sources versus oral uh, sources. One of the um, one of the hottest Orthodox books right now 
uh, here in America is a book by a Greek presbytera, Dr. Jeannie Constantinou, <coughs> called Thinking Orthodox. And it's being bought and read by, by thousands and thousands across the country. And it's a very interesting book because it talks about developing an Orthodox phronima. And that's a Greek word that is much more familiar to the Greeks than it is to the non-Greeks, but still it's a very important Orthodox word. And one of the things that she talks about, and she's, she's said this in discussions with um, Protestant and evangelical podcasters, is that not everything back then, not only was not everything written down, but people during the early church, you know, during that, that period, didn't trust written sources. They didn't trust written sources because written sources could be easily altered. How did you know that a document came from an apostle? How, why, maybe it came from a Gnostic. How do we know? Uh, and it was harder to tell that than it was to tell the oral sources. That's why a lot of times when St. Paul talks about writing a letter to somebody, he says, and I will have so-and-so deliver it to you. In other words, I'm going to have a trusted person bring you my written letter so you know from who it came and things like that. But even when, when, when we look at the scriptures themselves, we clearly see <coughs> that not everything is written down. And, and, and this from the, the, the scriptures themselves. First, I'm going to read you a couple of verses. First Corinthians 11, <coughs> verse 2. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. First Corinthians 11, 2. Another one. And this is a little bit more famous for us Orthodox. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter, 2 Thessalonians 2.15. And finally, from Revelations 3.3, remember therefore what you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent. I often tell my parishioners, when you hear the scriptures, when you read the scriptures, don't read just what's there, read what's not there. Especially when it's the Lord talking, because the Lord shows his words very carefully. He says, I give you what the Father has taught me to say. Nothing was capricious. So, uh, for example, in that last verse, which is the Lord speaking uh, in Revelation chapter 3, he does not say, remember, therefore, what you have received and, and read from me. Re you know, <laughs> remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But while not everything may be written, everything was passed down. I mean, we only have a very small amount of what the Lord taught in the scriptures. If you put it all together, it, it's really not that long in terms of being a, a consistent book. <coughs> but Paul, so here's where we have an issue regarding this thing called tradition. Paul teaches Timothy. He says, Timothy, my son, what I have taught you, teach to other men so that they can teach other men. Now, he doesn't say, Paul teach this to everyone he says teach this to other men presumably meaning specific men who then in time will be those who pass it on faithfully from one generation to the next which is the very definition of paradosis itself so th this idea that paul who would be the first generation of christians is teaching timothy who in his youth clearly represents <coughs> the second generation of christians is then passing on what Paul taught him to the third generation of Christians, who then do take it to the fourth generation. I often ask my Protestant friends before I, I talk about what Paul told Timothy, wouldn't it be great if you could meet someone who lived around the year, oh, let's say 100, 110, 130, and, and what did they know and what did they teach? Oh, yeah, that would be really great if we could do that. Well, we can do that. Because we, we know who those men are who were taught by Paul, who were taught by Timothy, who were taught by the men Timothy taught. We know who they are. Some of them lived at the same time as the apostles themselves. They're even, we believe, mentioned in Scripture. So if Paul taught Timothy, who faithfully received what he was taught, whether by word or by letter, passed it on to the next guy, who then passed it on to his successor, as an overseer of one of the apostolic 
communities, we know what they were taught because we have the apostolic fathers. We know what Clement taught in Rome. We know what Irenaeus taught in Lyon. We know what Ignatius taught in Antioch. We know what Polycarp taught. Polycarp knew someone who knew, I mean, he knew John. So, I mean, these men knew the apostles in many cases. And what they teach in the year 100, 110, 130, 150 is the same as what was taught by Paul to Timothy and that whole generation. So we know that everything is passed down, therefore, because also the church is not only the pillar and bulwark of truth, but because the fullness has already been given. So we, we have that issue. Not everything is written down, but everything has been passed down. Some of it not written, some of it oral. And um, again, you know, as we see in, in 2, Corinthians, uh, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, it is clear from scriptures that very little uh, is in the scriptures uh, that much of it was oral, you know, the oral tradition. So knowing that, however, doesn't excuse us from developing an apologia from develop, de de developing a defense. And, and the scriptures are very clear that we have to have one and we have to be ready to present that in season and, and out and so forth and so on. So if we're defending the truth, that means we're defending it against, by very definition, if you're defending the truth, you're defending it against falsehood. You're defending it uh, not only against falsehood, uh, but against distortion, against uh, compromise, and things like that. And you have to be able not only to defend it, but you've got to be able to explain it clearly, not in a confusing way. Uh, sometimes like Paul, becoming um, like the people that you're ministering to so that in adopting their ways and their language and things like that, you can present the gospel in a way without compromise to them in such a way that they understand and comprehend and embrace and internalize it. So having said all that, one or two more observations. Having said that, here's the problem we face in going into apologia with, with Roman Catholics or Protestants. First of all, there's a foundational difference. When I ask people who say, Father, what's the difference between the Roman Catholics and us? To, to the average layman, there's a lot that looks the same. The average Protestant looking at us, there's a lot that looks the same, and they often present to us their anti-Roman Catholic uh, diatribes that, and, and sometimes they say, yeah, oh, we don't like the Pope. And we go, well, yeah, we don't really like him either, but you know, and, and they're sometimes surprised to hear us affirm what they're saying. But when you get down to, to foundational issues, for example, people complicate apologetics. This is why I'm saying this. Apologetics is often complicated because people don't know how to explain and defend the truth. For example, people say, father, what's the difference between the Roman Catholics and us? And I ask them, well, what do you think the difference is? Well, uh, married priests and, and, uh, and, and beards and incense or, you know, whatever they come up with. Sometimes the list is like this long. And I said, well, some of those are issues and some are not. Well, we have unmarried priests. So what? Right. Um, but we need to understand the foundational things that separate us. Like, for example, between us and the Roman Catholics, there's only I would contend. There's only one thing that, that is different between them and us, only one. And if we understand that one thing and how to talk about it and explain it and so forth, we're in a different position where we can maybe understand what's holding union back between us two. And, and John, let me ask you, what do you think that one difference, that one foundational difference between us and the Roman Catholics, what would you pick as that one issue that, that undergirds everything else? Uh, the phronema or the papacy. Or... Well, you're, you're, you're close. You're, you're close with both. Mm. Uh, the, the papacy is, is a result of yep. this issue, and that issue is authority. Authority, yeah. Authority yeah. is the, if we solve that, see, you know, authority, who has it? When do they have it? How do they exercise it? That's the issue. Yep. Now, for them, mm. it's wrapped up in the papacy, and that creates the difference between them and us. Because if the Pope has the ability to say anything at any time about any subject and define it for the universal church, we have a problem. Yeah. Okay, so the, 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 there's there's yeah. foundational differences between us and the Roman yeah, Catholics. That's, between us, that's between helpful. Between yeah. us and the Protestants. There's also, uh, with the Protestants in particular, to a lesser extent with Roman Catholics, there's a huge <laughs> historical difference. A lot of them think, Church history started with Martin Luther nailing his 
95 Thesis to the Wittenberg Cathedral doors, and that's not quite true. Um, but, but even when you look at other issues, for example, uh, I would say between us and the Catholics and the way that the Protestants look at this one issue, the issue of the Great Schism. Now, I'm one of those uh, horrible modernist heretics that would claim the Great Schism is, is an overblown thing that we talk about because it's incredibly misunderstood because the common perception is, well, the Pope excommunicated all of the Orthodox and the Orthodox excommunicated all the cat. That's not what happened. When Cardinal Humbert placed his bull of excommunication on the altar of St. Sophia, it was directed at the patriarch and only at the patriarch. And supposedly he was acting in the name of the Pope who had died in the meantime, making the bull completely null and void. Um, but the reality is there were schisms before, uh, there were reconciliations after the so-called great schism only to open up again. Antioch remained in communion with Rome way into the 14th, uh, 14th century, if not the 1400s, they were in communion with Rome for a long time afterwards. And so was to a lesser extent Alexandria. So this kind of stuff was in great flux and, and the way we we look at things and we elevate events that happen to some status that they really don't deserve, then complicates uh, the dialogue moving forward. So foundational, historical, and the last thing is translations. You're very fortunate that as a Greek speaking man and studying ancient Greek, you can look at the scriptures in their original language and have a comprehension that is way beyond what most Protestants can look at. So they open their Bible, and what are they arguing from? They're arguing from English. Now, the problem then is there are some words that were translated from Greek into English and which remain, regardless of the translation you look at, remain consistently translated a certain way that complicates our ability to do apologia. I'll give you an example. Yeah. And Joseph knew her not until she had delivered her firstborn son. Now, when we argue the ever virginity of Mary, Protestants look at that verse and say, oh, he didn't have sex with her until she gave birth, which to them means that after she gave birth, Joseph and Mary had sex and therefore had more kids. Because the word until in English means that a certain action hits a, a, a certain point in time, and then after that certain point in time, it's a different action, okay? But as you know, the word eos in Greek does not mean that. Yep. So um, even with translations, we're translating words that don't even have the same meaning. And unless we're talking with a Protestant who understands that and can appreciate that, it complicates the, the whole area of apologetics. And finally, thank you for your patience, but one more thing, one more point that I think is important to make. And this point was made by one of our great American saints, St. Innocent of Alaska, who was a Russian bishop who came over to Alaska and did, did some fantastic things. Um, we have a phrase in English, a Renaissance man, a man of varying abilities and gifts and talents. And that was St. Innocent. And he wrote a letter to a, uh, a, a young priest that he wanted to, to send into the back country of, uh, of Alaska to do missionary work. And he says this, uh, cultivate always a modest and lowly spirit and do not presumptuously promise yourself extraordinary or certain success in your labors. Such expectations proceed from pride and grace is not granted unto the proud. Now, here's the important verse. Remember always that the conversion of a sinner or a heathen to the right path comes not from us or from our skill, but directly and solely from God. So here you have it. You can know all you want in the right languages and have the right historical facts at your fingertips and so forth. But unless you have the right phronema, really, and you understand that it's God who calls all men to himself, then all of that is really for naught. So having said all that, uh, by way of introduction, I just wanted to sort of make some, some I guess, some points about what we have to be aware of before we're approach, uh, approaching apologetics, because we, we can't just dive into arguments without understanding with whom we're talking and the context of, of where they're coming from. 
yeah i think that was very helpful for uh, the listeners to distill some or distinguish some things that or point out more things that should be mentioned in a discussion like this so just a follow-up question to what you have said um I'm trying to enter into a Protestant mind now. And how would, let's say, a Protestant now, it's a very broad term, as you mentioned in the beginning. So you can answer this uh, from wherever angle you want. Um, But how would they receive this information? You mentioned the, the Apostolic Fathers, for example, and... For me as an Orthodox, that's a very convincing statement uh, that we should also look to them, the receivers, let's say, of the teachings of the apostles that can interpret it and that have sat at the foot of the apostles and know the mind and know what they mean and what they don't mean. So just to give an example, some some Protestants, because they're more, let's say, traditional in a sense they say but we we do use the church fathers we we do quote them we do read them but i always think that but yeah but what what does that actually mean Uh, take something like monasticism many of the fathers we love basil and others they are De- steeped into the monastic life they, ra- they write biographies of monastic they are creating monasteries yet this big tradition of the church is suddenly removed from a lot of protestantism actually in sweden i think up to nine, 1950 somewhere it was forbidden to create new monasteries so that, that just an illustration of the bigger picture so but yeah, that, there are some thoughts there. Maybe you can elaborate uh, something. Uh. Well, the, the Protestantism, Protestantism today doesn't even match the Protestantism of the Reformation. For, for example, Martin Luther, John Calvin, and Zwingli, the, the, the big three of the Protestant Reformation, the, the, you know, considered the founders of the Protestant Reformation, all three of them believed in the ever virginity of Mary. Their churches today do not. So Protestantism is not about really recovering the past as, as really they tried to do during the Protestant Reformation. A lot of it is a, a, a complete um, reduction to papal authority where everybody has become their own personal pope and is able to interpret the scriptures any way they want to, which of course creates a problem. Because if, if you and I, let, let's say uh, you were a Protestant, God forbid, let's say you were a Protestant and, and I'm sitting down with you and talking with you about some topic. And, you know, you could pick infant baptism, you could pick uh, 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 the, the, the real presence of Christ and the Eucharist, you know, things like that, uh, Mary, whatever. And you come to one complete different conclusion than I do. And we're both arguing from the scriptures. Now we have a problem. And, and here's the problem. And it's one of four choices. Either you're right and I'm wrong. And and by the way, you know, we both claim to have the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is going to lead us into all truth and illuminate our senses. So we understand the scriptures, you know, and all kinds of things like that. So either you're right and I'm wrong. I'm right and you're wrong. We're both right, which if we're coming to completely different opposite conclusions is not an option, but I'm going to throw it in there anyway. Or we're both wrong which for the same reason of number three, number four is probably. So we're really dealt dealing with two options here. You're right and I'm wrong, or I'm right and you're wrong. Now, how do we show which one of us is right? We both can claim to have the Holy Spirit, but having the fathers on my side, I can show you how the early church thought about almost any particular subject very early on and how it consistently remained uh, in keeping with the Orthodox, with, with the early church's phronima, that was consistent going back to Second Temple Judaism and, and even earlier. So when one has uh, the fathers on their side, they can argue from a standpoint that the other cannot argue from. And you mentioned Protestants are discovering the church fathers. Yeah, they are, but they're cherry picking them. Uh, I, I'm in a, a, a group 
on Facebook. I'm not going to say which one, but I'm in a group on Facebook of, of Protestants that are reading patristic material. And a lot of them have moved to, to moved to the position of embracing baptismal regeneration, which is what we believe baptism is all about. Uh, they're moving to that point from whatever point they held before because they're discovering the early church fathers taught that. And it's yeah. painful to watch some of them go through this process because they're having to work through really kind of abandoning and, and foregoing and, and renouncing things they've held dear for decades, which they're now realizing are either false teachings or wrong teaching, whatever they're realizing they're, they're, they're giving away. But um, I, I encourage Protestants to read the fathers. I want them to read the fathers. So when they threaten me and say, well, I'm going to go look at that myself, please, please, please do that. I want <laughs> you to read for yourself and find out for yourself. So that, that's a good thing. You know, when, when Protestants are saying that, that's a good thing. We encourage them and we, um, we, we hope that they do find um, truth you know, yeah. and, and the witness of the early church and things like that in, in, in what, they're, um, what they're doing. So one question then that... Um is a big divide uh, and a question that many protestants ask and struggle with even those that want to be orthodox is the around icons um, we read in the old testament you should not make uh, images or something to that uh, effect and uh, it seems uh, straightforward so What's wrong with us? Why do we have so many images in our churches? Well, th th that's a very good question. I, I, I actually think the number one um, issue for most Protestants is Mary. But icons is probably number two. Yeah. But actually, icons is the easier one to defend from, from Scripture. It's the easier one to defend. And I think first we have to define what idolatry is. So what is an idol? An idol... And, and I don't think any Protestant would 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 um, disagree with this. So what is an idol? And, and I'm distinguishing that from what is an image. It's really two different things. Um, an icon means image. We all know that. But what is an idol? An idol is something that is the creation of the human mind trying to comprehend what God or a God is. The Greeks saw them in very, in, you know, 3,000 years ago, whatever, the Greeks saw them in very anthropomorphic ways. You know, I'm human, my God must be sort of a superhuman, but looks like a human. So they, you know, they, they made statues and everything that looked like people. Um, but other um, more primitive cultures would erect a, a, a pillar and maybe decorate it with, with gold and silver and things like that. And that pillar didn't merely represent some other god someplace in the heavens that pillar was god to them so that pillar that they made with their imagination and all of that kind of stuff that pillar was the god to whom they offered worship that was it now if we read very carefully which a lot of protestants don't do when we read in um the scriptures what um really what um, uh, the, the, the scriptures say, okay? Um, I, I think it, it's very clear what the Lord is trying to do here. So we go back to Exodus 20, because when they start talking about no graven image, and by the way, graven means engraved. It means that they tried to put a face on that pillar or they tried to carve it out somehow. And when we go to Exodus chapter 20, it says this. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. These are important words. For I, the Lord, the God, uh, I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, and so forth and so on. Now, he says, You shall not make an image of something in heaven on earth or under the earth or in the sea okay so in other words nowhere <laughs> you, you can't have this image anywhere but see here's the thing 
if if the Lord says to the Israelites, you are not to have a an image and 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 forget worshiping and serving them. See that that that's the important part that's often left off. I mean, we don't serve icons. We don't offer worship in front of them and serve them as if they are some sort of carved image. We don't do that. But what's also interesting to note is the Lord is saying, do not imagine in your puny human mind that you can think about who I am and what I am and things like that. Don't even bother. You can't do that. You, you can't possibly in your puny human mind, imagine who and what I am and make an image that represents me. Now, that has to be the meaning because how else can you explain only several chapters later how the Lord says when describing the, the, the tent of meet, meeting, you know, that the, the tent of meeting is the precursor to the temple of Solomon. How do you explain then the Lord saying to the Israelites, make images, icons, make images of cherubim and he doesn't stop there and seraphim doesn't stop there and other things that are going to decorate the tent of meeting now what are cherubim and seraphim if not images of things in heaven but back in exodus 20 he said don't make any images of anything in heaven but here he's telling them not only to make them he then says i'm going to put my holy spirit in these two guys and i'm going to inspire them and teach them how to do that now why would the lord forbid the making of images in one chapter and then prescribe the making of Im certain images in another chapter if not the context of what's being meant is you're not to imagine what i look like because you can't but what i tell you i am or how i look or or anything like that you will do it my way now that much from the old testament i think is very clear how else also do you explain the bronze serpent in the wilderness? How else do you explain the image of the cherubim over the mercy seat? You know, there, there's too much in the Old Testament that is, that is that of imagery. And one only has to point to existing archaeological sites, such as the, uh, not only the, the baptistry, but the synagogue at Dura Europus, Look it up, folks. The synagogue at Dura Europus. Can you which tell us something about that? On the that? inside yeah. with iconography. Yeah. From what century is that synagogue? Second. Second. So, one. Uh, thing... We think it could be earlier, but we think yeah. it's second century, if not earlier. Yeah. I was at the museum, visiting museum here in Thessaloniki, and I saw for myself some of uh, family graves. And there were iconography in inside of them and not only in a systematic way they have done <laughs> like this cubes and painted within them scenes and different things so is it so yeah i think it's if i think we need to be careful here because protestants say yeah but we don't have evidence that they venerated the images but if you are going to use the old testament against images it speaks about not even making them so if we have evidence that christians and jews have always made images and actually is commanded by god then the foundation for being against it is kind of uh, falling well, apart yeah you're, you're right but remember that again images um icons uh images and um uh idols are two different things yeah so, so I think I think the the prohibition against idols is very clear. Yes. Yes. Now, when when the phrase in Exodus twenty says graven image, um, again, we're not that far away from talking about idols because if, if you look at what he says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, which clearly means that they're they're constructing an idol. Yeah. You know, an an image, an icon is not is not carved. You know. Yeah. It, it it's painted or whatever but 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 we're, we're clearly talking about images in that sense now if we if we and the protestants can agree okay we're, we're not supposed to make idols we both agree on that then they'll say well what about these images that you have again dura europus and all of these other places that i uh that 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 archaeology has uh uncovered and and clearly demonstrated in 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 this church from the first century from the second century in tiberius lately 
Uh, there were these excavations that revealed these incredibly beautiful mosaic floors with images of things in heaven and on earth and so forth. Makes one then question how the Protestants are interpreting the whole idea of image. Now, when they say, well, we don't have anything um, that, that's, that's widely um, uh, available uh, or, or preserved from be, before the, the seventh, eighth century, well, yeah, we fought uh, virtually a civil war in the Eastern Roman Empire over icons. And, and during that time, a lot of them got destroyed. You know, when the, when yeah. the Byzantine emperor is an iconoclast and says to his army, go to this town and destroy every icon you can find, and they do it, yeah, there's not going to be much left for, for us in the 21st century to ooh and awe over. We just yeah. don't have that. So um, th so that that's that's one reason why when, when people object, well, there's nothing, you know, well, there are in the catacombs, and there's plenty of catacombs, not just in Rome. There's catacombs elsewhere that have uh, um, images preserved, and some of them contain Mary and Jesus and, 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 and other images like that. So the images are there and they've yeah. been there since the very beginning. Now the question is, okay, then if you can you can bring a Protestant somewhat along from a historical perspective or even a religious one and, and kind of convince them that it's okay to have them, uh, then how do you bring them from, okay, they're okay to hang in the wall as decorations, but why do you kiss them and things like that? And again, that goes to theology. And ultimately, icons, which were defended at the Seventh Ecumenical Council, most people who study history know what that is. Um, and, and we have to point out that all of the ecumenical councils defended the Christology of Jesus Christ. So if at the Seventh Ecumenical Council in 787, we were defending icons. It's not because we said, oh, they're pretty pictures. We want to keep them. It's because we were saying, as John said in his prologue, what we have seen, what we have touched, you know, he who, who walked among us, who ate among us, who was with us and all of that, he took flesh. He wasn't a phantasm. He wasn't a, a ghost. He wasn't uh, anything that the Gnostics or, or anybody else said he was. He was a living, breathing a uh, divine human person and his humanity therefore which was not a phantasm or a ghost or anything else can be represented it couldn't be before because we couldn't see him but now we can see him and because we can see him and he was visible to us and he came into this world as a real divine human being we can depict that humanity in icons not to mention the humanity of everybody else who knew him then and since yeah. And if, you know, we could, I've asked Protestants this question. If Jesus could appear right now before you, how would you react? And, and I've, got, I've gotten a lot of really interesting questions. I, you know, I said, but, you know, you can't hug them or back slap them or fist bump them. It, you know, Isaiah was taken into heaven and fell on his face. Uh, uh, decrying his sinfulness from what he saw. When Ezekiel had his vision on the, the, the banks of the river uh, in Babylon, um, he, was, he was speechless for days. He was so shocked at what he saw. You can't tell me that you wouldn't be overwhelmed and on your face on the ground if Jesus mm -hmm. were to appear suddenly before you, not to mention his mother or you know anybody else. And if that's the case, then... The image that we also fall down before, we are not worshiping, but we are saying to ourselves, this image is the image of the living God. And we will honor it as if we were to honor him. So we're, we're transferring the love, the affection, all of these things that we might feel for whoever, our Lord, our lady, you know, <coughs> we're transferring that devotion and that affection that we have to it. And be, before the advent of the smartphone, you know, before people could put a thousand pictures on these things, people had wallets and they would keep pictures in them. And 20 years ago and 25 years ago, <clears throat> I used to ask people, can I see your wallet? And they would take out their wallet and I'd open it up. And inevitably they had the little accordion folder thing that would have pictures of their kids and their dog or whatever else in it. And I said, why do you have these in here? To remember, I look at them, I, you know, I know who I love and things like, well, then how different is that from having an icon in my wallet, a 
picture of someone I love and, and so forth. My, my grandfather during World War II had a picture of his son who was in the Navy on his nightstand. And my mother said every night he spoke to it, he kissed it, you know, hoping that he would see his son again. But that kiss wasn't given to a photo. That kiss was given to the reality that that photo represented. Yeah. And icons are really no different than that. We don't worship them, but the veneration and the honor we give to that, that, that image, we feel is being given to the prototype. Yeah. I think uh, knowing Christology well will help in this field because... Yeah. You know, N N Nestorians will say, but uh, are you worshipping the human part or the divine nature? And the thing is that there is only one person in Christ with the divine logos. So we don't separate them. Yeah. So we don't rest separate. And my teacher in uh, an exam tried to trick me there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have been through this <laughs> uh, in front of the class. Okay. Um, I wanted to mention something here that I <clears throat> that a Protestant I heard a Protestant bring up that I thought was a, a thoughtful uh, worry that uh, that I have been thinking about concerning icons and and he said that let's say we can make icons and uh, maybe he agrees to that to some point but isn't it um, a dangerous thing that some people will actually worship that they will not be so informed as you and I are. My response here, and I want you to comment this and then we can move on, is if we're going to think like that, I think we need to look at the bigger picture. People didn't only worship things that they made themselves. They worshiped the sun, the trees, the earth, everything. So in a sense, God himself took that risk by creating a world. And if he does it, then I think we have a foundation at least. You know, we can't destroy the world, destroy all images, because there is the potentiality that someone will do something un inappropriate with it. So th that is basically my response. I want you to comment that on that, and then we can move on. Well, that, that's, a good, that's a good question. But pe people have an innate desire to worship. And if they're not directed toward the triune God, they're going to worship politicians or political parties or nations or past history or, you know, cities. I mean, you're, you're Greek. You know how the Greeks look at Constantinople. Um, it, it's not what it was, but people wish it was what it was. Um, we can worship a lot of things. People worship nature. They can worship their their kids. You know, they, they can put everything in life can become an idol. Everything in life can become something we put before God. And I think it's, it's not just, I'm not, icons are the least of my worry when it comes to that. I worry about the other things people make into idols and put before God before I'm ever going to worry about some pretty picture they hang on a wall and light a candle in front of. Yeah. So the question of icons is related in a sense, in a sense to the question of the saints. So we are talking about depict, depicting actually persons and events. So yeah. why do we Orthodox actually pray to the saints? Okay, uh, well, that, that, that's, again, another good question. Boy, um, <laughs> I, I, I want to go into a digression, and I, and I apologize for having to do that, but I think it's necessary to understand certain things. Um, and again, this is more understandable in Greek than it is in English. So in, in, in English, we have saints. And we have, um, uh, your, is your patron saint the forerunner? Yeah. The Podromos or, or the? Uh, the Prodromos, yeah. The okay. forerunner. That, that, and that's mine. That, that's the saint I was baptized under. Um, okay. So in English, we have these saints and they have a title. Saint John, you know, Saint Joseph, Saint, uh, I don't know, Nicholas or whoever. And in English, for a lot of reasons, um, the word saint is looked at as a title. So, you know, we have, um, we have Patriarch Bartholomew, we have President Biden, we have um, Podcaster John, you know, or whatever. But these are all titles. And they, they th in the minds of most of the faithful, um, they, they see it as respectful and so forth. Even many Protestants will call saints saint, you know. 
um, one of the, the, the most beautiful churches on Fifth Avenue in New York City is called, I think, St. Thomas, and it's a Presbyterian church. So, you know, even, even sometimes they use that title, but it's, it's seen as a title. The thing is, it never was a title. So way back when, when you look at icons, you had O Agios Ioannis Podromos, the, the Holy One, comma, John the Forerunner, or something like that. So Agios was not a title. Agios was an adjective. The Holy John, the Holy Elizabeth, the Holy Catherine, the Holy, I'm looking up at my, my, my prayer corner, the Holy Nicholas, you know, whoever. It wasn't a title. It was an adjective. And we forgot over the years where the very word agios came from. And, and I, I've said this to my parish on a number of occasions and anybody who will listen, that the, the root word in agios is the word gios, which to our English speaking listeners simply means earth or of this earth or of this world. There's a lot of ways it could be used in context is very important. So you had gios. Now, when the Greeks wanted to negate anything, they would put an a or an on in front of it. So agios of this world became agios, not of this world. So saints don't belong here. They belong to the kingdom above, you know, they can, but to the kingdom. To, so they're not citizens of this world. We're all reminded as saints, by the way, that we're citizens of a heavenly kingdom. So we are not of this world. That's why Paul could address his letters to the holy ones to the saints who are at whatever city um we are not of this world so it's not a a, a title it, it's really meant to be an adjective to which we are called now furthermore then then take that a little bit further why are we called that because we have been baptismally regenerated into the body of christ we have been enfleshed not just robed bad english translation as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. But that's not what the Greek says. As many as have been baptized into Christ have been enfleshed into him. We have become part of his body, his very body. And, and, and St. Paul says, therefore, members one to another, not only members to him. So if someone is in Christ, and, and as St. Paul says, they're a new creation, then they shine with and, and glow with um, the very divinity or or meant to that Christ himself imparts to us through his grace. We're meant to become by grace what he already is by nature. St. Athanasius's famous comment. Um, so if someone is therefore a saint, someone has become, as we would say, deified in the body of Christ in the kingdom to come. What we await and what we get a foretaste of in the church itself and the divine liturgy and so forth. So when we talk about praying to the saints, we're, you know, and obviously the Protestants mean the dead ones, and we would say, well, they're not dead, and they don't get that, so we can't, you know, it's hard to argue that point. When we are praying to them, we're not praying to people who are dead, because they are, scripturally speaking, they are alive in Christ. They're not dead. They're alive in Christ. So their soul, their, their very person is part of Christ's body and hasn't stopped being part of Christ's body uh, just because of their death. The tragedy is the, the ripping of the soul and the body apart in death. But the soul is still with the Lord. Uh, now, um, so here's the thing. Scripturally, we can see um, that there are a lot of examples of, of the sanctity of, uh, of, a, of what we would call a dead person that even show forth in, in the scriptures. And the first one I would point to is 2 Kings chapter 13. Elisha has died and has been buried. And a dead man later, a few verses later, comes into contact with the bones of Elisha and comes back to life by touching the bones of a dead man, a dead sanctified man who had double this portion of spirit of his mentor, Elijah. Elisha had double the portion. And to, to talk, to take that even further with relics and things like that, I mean, he took the mantle of Elisha, of Elijah, struck the river, it, it parted and things like that. So there's all kinds of things that ha happen through sanctified matter, whether of the person or of the thing the person touched, which is also shown in Acts, where it says, 
when Peter, James, and John were going to the temple, people were trying to just lie down in their shadow. And then later we're, we're touching them with handkerchiefs and taking them back to people who are sick. And it says, so that they could be cured. So when you have this kind of sanctification showing forth from sanctified people who clearly are uh, displaying the grace of God, not their own holiness or sanctity because we have them, but the sanctity and grace of God himself coming through us, then if we take all that into consideration, it paints a different portion, uh, a, a different picture, um, a portrait of uh, saints as, as we see them versus as Protestants see them. The Protestants, dead people are just dead people. But again, scripturally, you go to this, you go where, you know, um, there's a faithful multitude praying for us. It, you know, Hebrew says that, Revelation says this. So how do you account for these people being dead if there's already a faithful cloud of witnesses interceding for us? Where do they come from? Who are those people? And uh, again, you just have these, these, uh, th th this testimony to the, to the incredible grace and sanctity of, of, of not only dead people, but martyred people, for example, uh, Ignatius or, or whoever being torn apart you know, by the lions and his followers coming and taking the bones and going and burying them later on. They did that with Stephen. They did that with him. They did that with everybody. So there's something the early Christians understood about saints and, and their ability to intercede for us. And so they saw that their, their earthly intercession after their earthly death not ceasing because now that 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 person minus their body yes but you know who cares for now that person is now with christ in the kingdom that's been prepared for us by the way and is now interceding continuing to intercede for us in the heavenly kingdom but they have a closer proximity to the lord than we have down here so this is why this has always been seen as something that is good and, and spiritually profitable and right and so forth, that these, these, these saints never stop interceding for us. So we ask for their intercessions from them. Thank you for that uh, answer, Father. Sorry for the long answer, by the no, way. No, it's, it's uh, great. It's, it's excellent. And I think we need to move away from these quick uh, answers and actually understand some background. And I think you... It was great uh, in the way you did it. Um, one question uh, that uh, comes up here often is that, say a, per, a Protestant say, okay, I accept they live. There are some scriptural testimony to, towards that. And it's also theologically sound <laughs> that uh, we are alive in Christ. And we also see that saints actually pray for us in Revelation and in other places. But what, what is the foundation for us actually us, uh, communicating to the saints in, uh, in that direction? That's often a question that uh, comes up. <coughs> I, I, I don't think I caught the, uh, the yeah. question. How do, yeah. how do we do that? So in, in another word, um, why do we ask the saints to pray for us? We know they pray for us. But some Protestants say we should not ask the saints to pray for us. In well, they can't it... give a good reason other than, <laughs> than to say they're dead. And I think we've just yeah. addressed that we don't believe that. Yeah. From the scriptures, we don't believe that. I mean, you can even go into the Maccabees and all kinds of other books that they don't have, that they ripped out, that, that give testimony to this very thing. <laughs> but the idea that I can only ask you for your prayers while you're alive here and not ask for them once you've ascended and are, are part of the heavenly multitude makes no sense. Where can you find for me, Mr. Protestant, in the scriptures where that delineation is clearly made? I'll answer that for you. You can't because it's not there. Yeah, I think also Christ said that the resurrection will be like angels. And there is a communication between God and angels. And, uh, oh, absolutely. You, yeah. So, so, yeah. and I think something else I have been thinking about, sorry for speaking so much myself, no. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> is that sometimes we read the Bible knowing the story and we forget that the persons in the story don't always know the end and what's going right. on. Right. So yeah. if you take, for example, at the cross, Christ 
um, he's quoting Psalm 22, I think, when it says, my, my God, my God, or uh, why have you forsaken me? Mm -hmm. I think in that verse, people are not hearing exactly what he says, and they say, oh, he's calling upon Elijah to save him. So people not knowing uh, what's going on exactly think that. But what that shows us is that there is an expectation. There is people, there is, the, it's not strange in that culture to call up to a saint. I think that verse actually points us to that. So th there are a lot of things we could say here, but uh, I think we can move on to another question. Okay. And um, if you don't want to add something to that, that is. Okay. No, no, no. I, I don't. Let, let's uh, let's explore another area in tarot yes. part. So this is a question that's more um, perhaps sensitive or. And it's the question about. It's a question about soteriology, salvation, and. Uh, let's see, I have written down the question. It's, um, so some have said that the Orthodox has traditionally taught that everyone outside the Orthodox Church, no matter the reason for them being outside, are going straight to hell. And do you think this is a fair representation? Do you think this is uh, something that actually is reflecting the mind of god here or the church in this instance no i don't i think it's a very unfair thing and and the reason i think that is is this um i i i'm i read i i read with my own eyes a quote that that i saw on a on a facebook site from one of the <clears throat> metropolitans of the russian orthodox church outside russia so-called rokor and this metropolitan, I, and I think the, the quote was from the 1960s, maybe something around there. In this quote, this metropolitan said that we have to be very careful about claiming that because there are a lot of people that grow up in whatever church they grow up in. It's the only thing they've ever known. Um, and they'll, they'll, they may live and die in that church and never know anything about orthodoxy. Is God therefore going to condemn them because they never learned about the, the, the one true faith. No, he's not, because in their own way, they may be desperately trying to be as, 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 as best they can followers of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but that was basically the, the, uh, the, the quote. And when people cite councils and, and, and decisions about the heretics and the schismatics, they're citing canons and so forth, proclamations that were made about specific people in specific times who deliberately left the church. And a lot of Protestants nowadays find themselves in whatever they're in from family circumstances and that kind of thing. And it has nothing to do with the deliberate leaving of the faith. They just grew up as Lutherans or Anglicans or, or whatever they grew up as, you know, Pentecostals. And, and quite often they grew up in, in, a, in a church, maybe in, in, in some place where there is no Orthodox church for 100 miles. So how are they supposed to, to, to learn about the faith? When not only is there not a church close by, but we've been so divided, for example, here in America, that we've not been able to give effective witness in for, until maybe just a few decades ago in the language of the people of this country, let alone have materials in that language and things like that. It's really only been the last 30, 40 years when there's been an abundance of, of material that now can get out there, and it is getting out there. And you know the majority of our churches now use English here in this country, but that's that's a fairly recent thing. So so to complain that someone has not embraced orthodoxy when if they looked into it they saw something that was heavenly ethnic in another language um, that that didn't want to embrace them or anything like that. I mean I'm I'm orthodox and I remember as a teenager walking into a Greek church in Long Beach, California, and being told by the priest because I got there late and I wasn't able to attend liturgy who told me right to my face, you're not Greek, why are you here? Now, if I was, and he, I told him I was Orthodox, if I get asked that question, you can imagine what some Protestants are being asked. 
So if we've not made the effort to reach out to them and, and, and you know, things like that, we only have ourselves to blame. And we can't go around triumphantly saying, yeah, I'm going to heaven and you're going to hell. That's not the way it works. When you start thinking that way, you're going to join them there too. So I think that's a ridiculous thing for us to be saying when we haven't really made the proper effort to evangelize and missionize yeah. and, and really do constructive, engaging, serious outreach. Yeah. Uh, and, and sometimes even to the point where, hi, do you want to be Orthodox? No, well, you're going to hell. <laughs> you know, it, it's, 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 it, it's quite frankly sick and it's sinful. What I'm hearing you say here is that if you do, if you do, um, uh, if you are willingly leaving the church, knowing what you're doing, that's that's uh, something you will not find salvation in that yeah, process. It, yeah, yeah. When, when yeah. someone is, has has left the Orthodox Church, I, I believe so. And um, I, again, a lot of it is in God's time too. Um, sometimes yeah. I've seen people who have come to the faith take years before. They decide it's time for them to enter the faith. So during that time, are they being difficult? Are they being schismatic? Are they being, you know, what? Well, it, God has to work in them in in God's time, not in ours. Uh, we still have to love them. We still have to pray for them. We still have to be willing to engage with them, answer their questions, be patient. Uh, maybe their spouse doesn't want to come with them yet, and things like that. And I, I've I've dealt with that. Uh, only to see after a few years the spouse want to come in. I've got lots of great stories about that. So um, the, the idea that that we we want to be triumphalistic and uh, to the to the exclusion of caring for these people, um, I, I think is a huge, huge, huge not only a mistake. I think it's a sin when we do that. Yeah, Father Jonathan Ivanov. Thank you for this interview. It was, uh, uh, I think the audience and me myself have benefited greatly from this. And I hope we can do this again sometime. I'm uh, ready and willing when you are, John. Thank you again. God bless you. God bless all the listeners uh, who are going to be watching this. And I, I hope and pray for uh, our uh, in increased wisdom and discernment uh, in all things regarding the faith and its spreading and its propagation. May God bless us all. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye.